Okay, let's get started. My name is Chris Reagan and welcome uh, to this event being put on by the Max Bell School of Public Policy at McGill University. Let me begin by saying that I am sitting at my COVID desk in my home on Montreal's West Island. And like McGill University's downtown campus, my home is situated on the traditional territory of the Kanyan Kahaka, what we today often call the territory of the Mohawk First Nation. We recognize and respect the Kanyan Kahaka as the traditional custodians of the lands on which we meet today. But wherever you are currently sitting, I encourage you to better understand the history of your location and to recognize its indigenous heritage. Now today our event is um, really the final chapter of, of a conference that we held remotely at the Max Bell School back in September of last year. It seems like a lifetime ago, but it was September of 2020. Uh, and you see the title over my right shoulder, Choosing the Right Target, Real Options for the Bank of Canada's Mandate Renewal. As you invariably know, we are weeks away from the government and the Bank of Canada, maybe even days away from the government of Canada and the Bank of Canada announcing uh, the new uh, uh, mandate for the Bank of Canada. And so we wanted to take one final opportunity to talk about that issue, um, uh, you know, in the hopes that, uh, that whatever uh, views can get expressed here can get assimilated by those people that are thinking about this and making this decision. Um, so there's a very important issue. And I'd actually like to start, before we get to the panel, I'd like to start by doing something that we did back in the conference. So I'd like to put up a survey and Katrine, if you can, or Weston, if you can put up the survey here, we've got four options. Now back in September of 2020, we actually at the conference, we discussed six options, but I, I can't, we felt that, that these um, three, four options were the ones that were probably most useful to talk about. So the first option is the status quo, the second option is a dual mandate with the Bank of Canada targeting both CPI inflation or, uh, sorry, and employment or unemployment. The third is some form of inflation, uh, average inflation targeting, whereby the bank uh, matches um, low inflation with subsequent high inflation or vice versa uh, over the medium term, and then some other unspecified option. So, our goal here is that you will um, vote for one of these four options now, and then we'll do it again about 75 minutes from now after you've heard the panel, and then we'll be able to determine whether these panelists have been successful in changing your thinking. So if you can uh, just take um, uh, a moment here, do we see, I'm um, just now, we've got 33, 35, 37 people have, have voted. So if you can all vote, I'll wait for about another 15 seconds or so. Okay, we're down to the last five or six people. We're at 89% participation. That's actually pretty good. It seems to have stalled. So I am going to end the poll in five seconds. Four, three, two, one, and the poll is over. And there are the results. I'm going to share the results. Now, do you all see that? Or, Stephen, can you confirm? You can see that? Well, I can see it, yes. Okay. And uh, people in the audience are nodding their head, yes. Good. Okay. So there we have um, one third in favor of the status quo. 40% in favor of a dual mandate, uh, one fifth of the group, just a little bit over one fifth going for average inflation targeting and 6% who wants something else, uh, unspecified something else. So let's keep those, um, keep those stats handy in your head. Um, in fact, I'm gonna write those down. 32%, 40%, 22%, and 6%. Very good. And now it is my pleasure to turn this over to Stephen Gordon. Stephen Gordon is a professor of economics at Laval University and was a co-organizer with me of this conference uh, uh, 18 months ago, not quite 18 months ago. Actually, it was started to be about 24 months ago, and then COVID delayed it. 
And Stephen has been uh, just terrific to work with on this conference uh, and all of the paper editing and publication that we've done. So thank you very much, Stephen. But I'm going to turn it over to Stephen to be the moderator. And Stephen, you can introduce the panelists. OK, so uh, thanks for being here. Uh, I think this is a really important issue. Uh, it's, uh, we're going to be talking mainly about the mandate. I mean, we're, monetary policy is making headlines these days. But we're not going to be, we probably won't uh, resist talking, talking about uh, strategy and tactics in the short term. But we're trying to, the idea here is that what are the objectives that the Bank of Canada is trying to get at? And that's the idea of the mandate. So uh, in, in, during the conference, uh, Michelle Alexopoulos uh, presented the, uh, the case for the status quo. She went last, last time, because we, we sort of set it up as a trial for the status quo. We, gave, we wanted to have various options presented and then discussed. And then finally, the case for the defense was given to Michelle. Uh, she's going to go first this time. Followed by that, Mayor um, Sekerecha will be giving the, uh, making a case for uh, some kind of dual mandate. I think he has other ideas, but that's the, the uh, basic, stru basic structure is dual mandate, where that's going to hold up, uh, get, cover up any manner of sins. And Chris will uh, talk about the average inflation. Uh, uh, option. One thing, um, there will be a question period at the end. Please use the chat. Like, don't use the Q and A or holding a hand. Please use the chat. I can I can monitor the chat and we'll be monitoring the chat. We'll be using the using the, we're going to those at the end. But if I say if I see a question that I can insert easily into the, uh, the conversation as it goes, um, I will do so. So uh, don't hesitate if you have a, a question that would um, is timely for the conversation. Uh, that would be, um, we, we can try to do that. And conversation is the word. Uh, we're not doing it a formal presentation. We're, there's going to be lots of crosstalk interaction. And so there should be lots of opportunity for people to insert themselves uh, into conversation as it goes on. Okay, so um, and first I'm going to, I'm going to uh, first it's going to be Michelle first, then Mario, and then Chris. And uh, Michelle will start off, please. Go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. Uh... It's, it's wonderful to be invited to, to talk about this very important topic again. Um, when I started thinking about what we discussed, uh, as you said, it seems lifetimes ago right now, um, the first thing I think that I pointed out when talking about any of these frameworks was the, what the Bank Act really says, right? At the end of the day, for those who have never stared at it, um, it basically gives the bank control over Canada's monetary policy and highlights very specific goals. Specifically, it says that it's to regulate credit and currency in the best interests of the economic life of the nation, to control and protect the external value of the national monetary unit, and to mitigate by its influence uh, in the general level of productions, trade, prices, and employment, so far as it may be possible within the scope of monetary action, and generally to promote the economic and financial welfare of Canada. That's a very tall mandate. Uh, really, in, when we think about what has come out, we think about the status quo. And as it was just pointed out, I was asked to make the case for the status quo. And I generally still do believe that the status quo, with perhaps a few additions to it, would be the best option uh, for Canada. Now, what do I view as the status quo, which uh, should probably be a, a first order uh, thing to define? Really, it's the, the fact that this, the inflation target is set at the midpoint of a one to 3% target range with some flexibility, obviously, in terms of discretion. Uh, and that when we get to the effective lower bound, uh, unconventional monetary policy tools can be brought in, which is exactly what we've seen happen uh, during this uh, pandemic. Uh, on top of that, we have the regular communication with the public to disclose the bank's views, forecasts, and policy decisions uh, to lead some credibility and, and obvious communication. Now, what I was tasked to do uh, or asked to do by the, the fellow panelists is just to talk a, a very briefly uh, about what the different options were that were initially discussed uh, at the conference. And what I want to point out uh, that should inform any of our decisions is if we're going to leave the status quo, we need to have something that we truly believe is going to outperform it. Okay. And the data, if we think back in time, if we showed you graphs, you know, our status quo is it is maintained right now actually has performed remarkably well in terms of stabilizing inflation expectations. It brought them down after this, this uh, inflation targeting was brought to bear. 
Now, the contenders that we talked about last time really included price level targeting to some degree that it's crept in, even though there wasn't an official paper on it. Nominal GDP targeting, uh, incorporating financial assets into the IT framework, and then changing the target from this 2%, one case was to take it down to 1%, and another one to raise it perhaps to a number like 3%, which three to four has often been proposed. Now, when we actually are talking about things today, we're going to eliminate uh, the discussion really about price level targeting, nominal GDP targeting, and, and adding uh, the uh, financial assets into the framework, primarily because I think the majority of people felt that there were very um, serious communication issues uh, that come along with changing mandates uh, in this particular uh, way. These things often work really well on paper, but when we have to take it from paper and put it into practice, there are a lot of pitfalls that we could potentially fall into. The increases in uncertainty going to something that hasn't been tried. The problems uh, in educating the public in terms of what this new framework would mean if it hasn't been put into place in any other way does run risks of the central bank losing credibility if the change that they're proposing doesn't end up giving the benefits that they were hoping and end up having to uh, retract and, and change the framework uh, yet again in a fairly quick way. For the case of nominal GDP targeting in advance, there was also some data problems that were brought up and discussed about the timing of when we actually get information for the bank and the revisions to the data, although the revisions maybe were less problematic than, than the overall timing issues. Um, and when we talked about adding assets to the IT framework, I think it was felt that really macro prudential policy may be a better way of actually proceeding uh, in these particular environments because we add frame, we add tools to our toolkit. We can target things a lot better than we can using a single tool. Uh, well, I guess there's a few extra tools, but a single main tool for the Bank of Canada uh, in terms of trying to be everything to everybody. Okay, so. Really, I think that's where uh, we've started on this. Um, really, when I think about changing the from what we have right now, I think we are relatively stable. I do worry about changing to a different uh, inflation target. We did talk about that briefly in the um, panels before. And I think going down was not from two to one, was pretty much dismissed by most people. Yes, it does protect the value of the nation's currency, but we do run the risk of hitting the effective lower bound a lot more frequently, uh, according to a lot of simulations that the bank had done. Raising things from two to three also runs risks of whether you go from three to four or whether or not you lose some of the anchoring that we've worked so hard to achieve uh, over this time period. So that's what's really left, I think, the issue of the status quo. And as we go on, and I will move uh, away from, from some of the arguments and allow us to, to do a little bit more debate. I really think that you know we have to ask ourselves, what are we trying to gain? What is the main benefit associated with leaving something that we have a long history of, that the bank has worked very hard in terms of building people's confidence uh, about what they're doing and being able to communicate in a very clear and effective way what is actually going on and what is behind the decisions that they're making. So I do suggest when we talk about adding other things, there are some tweaks around the edges uh, that we could deal with, uh, especially when we're hitting the effective lower bound uh, that I made arguments for in the conference, but I'll leave that for some of our um, round table discussions going forward. Thank yeah, you. Um, that is a good point. In previous iterations of the previous uh, renewals of the mandate, uh, people certainly within the bank and outside uh, so the, the bar is pretty high for, for justifying a change. Uh, it's, it's, it's hard to argue that the status quo has failed in any sense. It really is. This, any arguments would be that something else would be better. And that's, uh, that, that's a harder argument to make. Um, but here's someone who's going to make it. Uh, Mario, do you want, Mario Sicarici, if you want to step in, want to talk into it about uh, how, how you see things. Uh, uh, thank you. And uh, well, thank you uh, both uh, Stephen and, and Chris for inviting me. I'm... Uh, I'm very happy to be here and, uh, and to engage in this discussion, which I think is extremely important. Uh, now, I should mention, first of all, that I'm part of a, of a generation uh, that believed in, in what I would call a pragmatic kind of art of central banking here. That is to say how to balance various goals out there. 
that should be achieved for society here. And uh, in this case, controlling inflation, of course, that should be of a concern. But there are other concerns, you know, such as achieving you know, maximum employment, as we know here. This is the dual mandate issue. Or, or indeed, connected with maximum employment, that would also be consistent, I would argue. They're not independent of each other altogether with a more equitable distribution of income and wealth. Uh, I mean, in a, in a society where we have mass unemployment, I would like to argue that there are more problems in terms of equity as well. And moreover, also, I would argue greater financial stability, especially for the private sector and the household sector in particular, if you have an economy that is concerned about employment as well, for instance. Okay? They're not unconnected. And talking about financial stability, of course, there's also, uh, as everybody knows here, the elephant in the room, so to speak, in terms of environmental concerns, as uh, former governor Mark Carney has been arguing over the last decade, for instance, yeah, that is also of a concern, but where's that in the mandate, you know, if, if indeed it should be there. Okay? Now, a, what I would call a socially responsible central bank should not be told once again to put on the, what I would call narrow blinders here and be mandated officially to focus on a 2% goal as the only thing that it should be worried about really, as if the others could be, you know, we could display a, let's call it indifference, you know, when it comes to these other concerns out there that are just as important. Now, yet, when we look at what has happened over the last 30 years, okay, since February 1991, talk about ages ago, okay, successive federal governments have mandated our central bank to focus solely on combating inflation. Now, despite the sort of narrow goal, I argue, okay, in reality, especially starting before already the, you know, the global financial crisis in 2008, you know, 2009, the Bank of Canada, together with some other central banks, began to engage in, they kind of put a, an adjective now in front of inflation targeting, as we know, you know, it became flexible inflation targeting. And it has meant different things to different people, I would argue, okay? But what is clear is that they did act in what I would call a much more pragmatic fashion. Indeed, really, it, it showed a great degree of pragmatism, for instance, during the global financial crisis, where they slashed you know, the overnight rate down to, to its lowest possible level at the time. And, and indeed, even more recently, I mean, a good example of what's happening, I mean, here we are in October with 4.6% inflation rate. And of course, the Bank of Canada has steadfastly held down its policy rate to its lowest possible level again, okay? Because, you know, it's concerned about what going, what, what is going on out there. And indeed, despite some of the attacks coming from let's say conservative, quote unquote, uh, you know, finance critics and so on, that maybe they should start raising interest rates. You know, this is something very important. So they are showing that pragmatism because there are other realities than just the inflation rate to be concerned about. Now, uh, more importantly also, if you look at the actual vocabulary over the last while, it's been changing, especially over the last year with, with the new governor, but it has been changing. And indeed, uh, as, as all of you know, the, uh, the, uh, uh, what we find is that the, uh, uh, the governor has been shown some concern with what he calls the inclusive economy, you know, with income inequalities, which is something happening all over the world. You know, there are many central banks that are talking about it, as we've seen in a recent conference, by the way, in Washington, uh, uh, well, online, but, you know, organized by the Fed on exactly that kind of, you know, issue. And what we've been seeing is the vocabulary changing there. And even just last week, you know, Larry Scambry, you know, Scambry there, uh, the deputy governor, in his speech to the Canadian Association for Business Economics, for instance, last Tuesday, was using the expression full employment, maximum sustainable employment. Now, in the context, however, in a context of an economy in which the trade-off between inflation and unemployment has practically disappeared, okay? 
there's it's it's been it's very low or non-existent as he himself recognizes and you know hence if the phillips curve is flat then you know what's left for the bank to do in this case and you know in a sense this is you know especially in the context of mcgill in quebec as they say in french plus ça change plus c'est la même chose there right i mean we're we're talking about something, but what they're thinking about is quite different and what they're doing is quite different as well, okay? Now, unfortunately, the Bank of Canada's uh, uh, existing mandate uh, remains shrouded, I would say, in this policy veil of inflation targeting that takes us back literally to the 1980s and early 1990s when most mainstream economists were only concerned about inflation fighting and who believed, of course, that if the economy is left alone, okay, and uh, the unemployment rate would return to some sort of God-given natural level out there. And after so many crises that we've been going through, starting with the global financial crisis, as we saw, now with the COVID crisis, you know, what we, of course, there is a real problem. And also for the sake of coherence and transparency, it's time, of course, to dump what I would call an outmoded IT policy framework and return to a sort of policy pragmatism in favor of what I call a multi-goal framework. That to some extent, if you go back historically from Graham Towers, you know, right in the Great Depression, you know, the first governor of the Bank of Canada, or Louis Rasminski, who I had the pleasure. Okay, of okay. We, we, we have a very short amount of time here. So yes, if, okay. If you wrap it up, Let please. Me just, yes, just one, uh, just one thing. Could I ask uh, Katrina if she could just pull that graph that uh, uh, on the screen here that I gave her? Okay. And just take note here, this is the unemployment rate for Canada and the US. It's just, just the raw data that I pulled out of, you know, the historical statistics of Canada and so on, and from the United States, from the FRED database. What's important to understand, now let's forget the 1940s, okay? But if we just look, because it was a special period, you know, in fact, in 1947, we had a 2.2% unemployment rate, for instance, in Canada, which is, you know, for many of us would sound incredible, okay? Now, but if you look at the 1950s, 1960s, all the way to the 1970s, the unemployment rate in both Canada and the United States, they align. Okay, they're pretty much moving in tandem, more or less. Okay? Then what happened? They start to bifurcate and throughout the 80s and 90s, except for, of course, during the financial crisis, as we could see here. They, otherwise, they bifurcated and in fact, now why? Obviously, you could tell all kinds of stories, but I'll just say one thing. It happened that the United States in 1978 adopted, in fact, the famous uh, uh, Humphrey Hawkins, uh, the, you know, the, the Full Employment and Price Stability Act, or what became the dual mandate also for the Fed at the time. And it showed that perhaps in the United States, there was less tolerance for high unemployment that we did show in Canada instead throughout that era. Okay. Now I leave it up to you, but that's my slide here to, to indicate okay. to what extent you know I think it's important to, to that mandates matter. Okay. Um, all right. So we, okay, we we'll, have we'll a lot of comments on that, but I guess we'll just go to Chris. Uh, rapidly does talk about average inflation targeting. I guess one point to make for is that uh, a lot of the arguments for average inflation targeting re resemble those of various level tar level uh, arguments so we, we a lot of the stuff we didn't we didn't cover the average uh, average targeting uh, mandate but we a, a lot of the ideas were in the, were covered in the, uh, in the in the in the conference so chris thank you uh yeah i'll cover a little, little bit on average inflation targeting but i want to make some more general comments as well including responses uh to michelle and mario um let me start with Mario. I mean, I completely agree with Mario when he talks about the art. He talks about being a member of a generation that believes in the art of central banking. I completely agree with the art of central banking and thinking about it as, a, as something that requires a huge amount of judgment and it is not formulaic. So I completely agree with that. Uh, and, you know, I think some people are queasy with the idea of central bankers using judgment, but I actually think it's precisely what you need and want is 
uh, smart central bankers who are looking at tons of data and who are thinking very clearly about the economy and who admit the th things that we don't know and they are nonetheless using judgment. Michelle talked about how when we at, try to add precision into a mandate, it often invites problems. And I, I couldn't agree more with that. Um, and I think that to me leads me to the notion of constrained discretion. And when I first started learning about inflation targeting, I learned about, you know, this was all after a debate in the 1970s about the rules versus discretion of central banking. And we came along to this idea of constrained discretion, the idea that you want your central bankers making judgments and using their discretion, but you also want some constraints placed on the central bankers. And to me, that always, that always resonated very, very strongly with me, that this combination of, of constraint and discretion. But I do want to hear, I, I want to remind people of what I think we learned about the limitations of central bank policy. And when I say what I think we learned, I mean we as a profession of economists and central bankers and policymakers, also over a time period of, I don't know, 50 years, something like that. But I think we, we made two lessons, two, uh, we, we, we learned two lessons over, uh, over many countries and over many years. One lesson was that inflation was very costly and we could talk at length about the, the many ways that high inflation was costly. And the second thing we learned um, is that inflation appears to be the one thing that monetary policy or central banks are able to influence in a sustained way. I don't just mean over a period of a year or two, but over in a sustained way and in a systematic way. Um, and this is, of course, the, the notion of a natural rate hypothesis or accelerationist hypothesis, which, of course, you know, was made famous in the late 1960s by Milton Friedman and others and became really conventional wisdom within the profession. And I note that there's a paper by Olivier Blanchard uh, from only three years ago, 2018, in the Journal of Economic Perspectives, uh, which is called something like, should we, should we keep or should we reject the natural rate hypothesis? And and I'll say this um, out of great respect for Olivier Blanchard, who also happened to be my thesis supervisor, but if there's anybody who was um, kind of prepared to reject the natural rate hypothesis um, of the leading kind of New Keynesian macroeconomists in the past 20 years, I would think uh, he would be close to the top of the list. Yet what he concludes in that paper is that there was some suggestive evidence only and policymakers really should proceed, at least for now, on the notion that you know, the natural rate hypothesis is still worth keeping or at least not worth rejecting. So if you accept these two, um, and I think these are pragmatic lessons, that inflation is a very costly thing, high inflation, and that inflation is the one thing that central banks are able to really influence in a sustained way and in a systematic way, then it's only a hop, skip, and a jump from those two observations to saying, well, let's target inflation. If inflation is the one thing we can control, then let's target inflation. And if high inflation is costly, then let's target low inflation. So I think this gets you to inflation targeting um, kind of logically pretty quickly. Now, I think it took the profession <laughs> quite a while to get there. It took, it took you know, 40 or 50 years to learn all of those lessons, but we got there. And I think, as Michelle has said, I think uh, inflation targeting has actually uh, performed very, very well. But one of the things we also learned, now, once you adopt inflation targeting, then you still have some options on the table. You could choose what inflation rate you're going to target. You could then have inflation targeting with some bells and whistles added in. You could have average inflation targeting. So all of those are within the general um, uh, category, general ballpark of inflation targeting. But one of the things that we also learned is that communications is really important. And Michelle talked a lot about this. And I, I think this is really important as well. And I think if you look at Canada's experience in the last 30 years, it's very difficult to conclude that inflation targeting, uh, number one, hasn't been successful. But it's also, I, I think, important to note that it has been well 
understood. Maybe not in all of its gory details, but when inflation is 3.5% and the central banker says, well, we are still committed to our 2% target, I think people and financial markets understand what that means. And when inflation is 1% and the central banker says, we are still committed to our 2% target, they kind of know that inflation is probably headed back up to target. They don't know exactly when, because that flexible inflation targeting uh, allows the central bank some time to get back to target. But this communication, this importance of communication comes back to this point that Michelle raised about when you add precision, you get complication. Uh, so on average inflation targeting, which you, you tend to think, well, okay, if inflation targeting is such a good idea, then what's wrong with average inflation targeting? You'll note that the Federal Reserve hasn't indicated over what time period they will be averaging. So when you say we're gonna have an average inflation target of 2%, you kind of say, well, okay, that sounds good, until you then think, well, what does that really mean? And I think the answer is, we're not quite sure what it really means. It doesn't mean we're just going back to two, it means we're going back to two sometime. Um, but you know, it, it's not clear whether we're averaging over two years or averaging over 22 years or something in between. And if you actually did write it down, and said, well, we're gonna be precise now and we're gonna make it average over 36 months, um, then you get problems as you, get, uh, as you approach the end point of that averaging period. Because then you actually have a central bank that is forced to take actions which may actually impose much more, uh, I don't know, much more volatility into the system. So when I come, when I layer in the importance of communications into the mandate choice, um, then to, to me, it gets even harder to replace the status quo because uh, I think it would be hard to explain to the Canadian people why we've decided to increase inflation to 3% as a target. Um, I don't think it would be as hard to explain a reduction to one, but I think at that point, you can also have a pretty reasonable but geeky conversation about, about effective lower bounds and downward nominal wage rigidity and stuff like that. But I think when you start talking about price level targeting or nominal GDP targeting, then I think communication gets very difficult because it's like it's hard to explain those in a good undergraduate class when you have 20 minutes in front of a whiteboard, let alone over a rubber chicken lunch when you've got five minutes and you're you know, a deputy governor of the Bank of Canada. That's hard to explain. So I come down to you know, the current system has been working very well. The word flexible, whether the word flexible is there or not, the, the, the nature of an inflation targeting system is that it is flexible and you've got time to get back to target. And my final comment, and I apologize if I've gone on too long, Mario said something about um, that it would be socially irresponsible, I suppose, to say that the mandate should just be inflation. And it's, that it's inappropriate to have a central bank that's indifferent about you know, higher unemployment or a bigger output gap or something like that. I guess I still believe in the notion of the divine coincidence um, of inflation targeting, which of course is nothing to do with a higher power. It's to do with the, the model in our minds about where inflation comes from and how monetary policy works. And if you believe that the pressure for inflation to rise or fall comes from an output gap that is either positive or negative, and I still believe that, although we can come back to that, and I think the evidence is reasonable on that, then if you are trying to target, bring inflation back to target, you are in the act of doing that, you are trying to close that output gap and bring you know, unemployment back to its natural rate or Nehru or whatever you choose to call that. And so I, I don't think it's about indifference about unemployment or indifference about the output gap. I don't think central banks are indifferent at all about those things. But I think from a communications point of view, they are saying, look, we realize that in the long run, the one thing we can really systematically control is inflation. So let's set our target in those terms. And, uh, and then let's, you know, let's just keep doing that as well as we can using the flexibility that we've got. I think I've spoken for too long, so I'll stop there. Um, I'm just going, okay, yeah, Michelle, go. 
I'll jump in. I want to add two things. Is I obviously from my initial comments, I think Chris and I have some fairly similar views on this. I, I do think that the bands do give a fair bit of flexibility, and so long as that is clearly communicated, uh, I think that this is is a very good thing, something that people do uh, understand. What I do worry about a little bit about again going with sort of explicit targets, multi targets, is in many times we're going to find ourselves missing some of the targets that we become very explicit about. And over time, when you do do that communication uh, aspect, the bank is gonna be forced into a position where over and over again, it has to explain, why am I missing this? Why am I missing that? How am I doing this? Now, I'm not going to say that unemployment is not a first order problem. But the other thing I wanna point out is we have a democratically elected government when it comes down to things such as income inequality, I don't think this is something, as, as Chris has mentioned, that the central bank has absolute direct control over. This is something, though, that a democratically elected government certainly can. It has tools to deal with it. And I think I much prefer having a government that I have elected make decisions on some of those aspects than a central bank that has independence but is not elected by the people who have one major tool at their discretion to figure out what to do. And, you know, when you, when you look at unemployment, again, you, you can see those waves, you know, do we deviate from the United States? Again, lots of people can tell lots of stories about this. I'm not entirely convinced that it's coming from what's gone on between the U S and Canada in terms of monetary policy. There are lots of problems with productivity that came in right during that time period and other things that were affecting this. So I think that the, I, I wouldn't uh, be completely sold simply based on the divergence of unemployment during that particular time. Okay, I'm going to give uh, Mario a chance to get back because yeah. I have some comments too. But to, to, before yeah. we all pile on him, he can uh, he can respond. Yeah, could I? Yeah, uh, uh, I don't know. I'll start with what uh, Michelle had just mentioned. Uh, that's still back of my head. Some of the other stuff that I'll remember hopefully. But uh, uh, yeah, look that gap <laughs> there that we saw. First of all, if you mention productivity, productivity is, is largely endogenous to the state of the economy. So if you have an economy that has mass un, uh, or much higher unemployment as the norm, you're going to have a different productivity growth for sure okay, that will deviate from an economy that is hitting the full employment sort of ceiling there. Okay, So I'm just saying that I have, uh, I'm not going to, you know, just to respond to that point, because it's clearly, you know, you're, you, perhaps you're putting the causality in the reverse here, but it's true that there could be other factors that explain that gap. It's not the only thing. And I didn't want to wed myself to say that it's just monetary policy. Absolutely not. Even fiscal policy, by the way, we were much more austere than the United States throughout that whole era. There are many things going on there in terms of macroeconomic policy in particular that would explain that gap. And But that gap, if it were true, that it was primarily because of these more austere policies that we pursued in Canada as compared to the United States, then that gap there, when uh, Chris said that inflation is costly, well, what the heck is that gap? Is that not costly for the economy? You know, I'm just saying here, if we would have been, in fact, aligned with the United States throughout that whole era, we would have, we, I think we would have been, and certainly in terms of standard of living, whatever kind of you know, measure you want to take here, that was a true loss for society, that whole era. And, and I attribute it in part, now I'm not going to, you know, I say I don't load it all to the central bank, the poor central bank, they're doing that. But for sure, it's an element in this whole picture. Okay, That's the first thing. Now, uh, uh, the fact that, uh, Chris, I'd like to comment here on the point that basically what the central bank is best adapted at doing is how it could control the inflation rate. This, you know. Now, excuse me, but if, if you know, we actually, Mark, I think is on this thing, uh, uh, Mark Lavoie and I, we've been saying this for like over 20 years, that the, uh, uh, the Phillips curve is largely flat for a large range of changes in the unemployment rate, okay? So if that is the norm, if we have a situation right now, which is that 
there is practically no Phillips curve, if you wish, or at least that the sensitivity of inflation here to changes in interest rates in the economy and all that, it is extremely tenuous to say the least. How can you possibly defend the idea that somehow the central bank is best adapted to dealing with that? that all of okay. that comes from a certain bagage here, which goes back to you know, the kind of quantity theory view that somehow central banks could control inflation. They cannot do so very well, and that's the problem already. Okay. Okay. But, I'm going to go to Chris now. Further. Yeah. Okay. Uh, two. I'll try to make these two quick <laughs> responses. So, so I want to come back to Mario's statement about the about the graph, the Canada-U.S. unemployment rate differential. So, look, I think I think you can have a very good discussion about uh, our unemployment rate, even independent of the United States rate or our rate relative to the U.S. rate. And you can talk about fiscal policy, you can talk about labor market policy, you can talk about unemployment insurance, you can talk about all kinds of things, probably as, uh, uh, as influencing that. And you can have a discussion then about whether those policies are desirable or not. I mean, I don't know anybody, any economist who doesn't think that employment insurance doesn't actually increase the unemployment rate. I think they all believe that, but they also might believe that that's appropriate policy right? Even though it may have the effect of raising the unemployment rate. So you can have that discussion. But at the same time, you can recognize if, if you want to, right, you can argue that um, monetary policy probably is going to have a very limited, I won't say an absolute zero, but a very limited longer run influence on those real variables. So you can argue about the unemployment rate or employment and the social costs of all of that, and still keep that, if you want, largely separate from monetary policy. That's the first point. And the second point is on the flat Phillips curve. So if, if you believe that the Phillips curve is in fact very flat, and let's suppose it's actually completely flat at the axis, so that there is a range I've had many conversations with, with Dick Lipsy about this. Uh, you know, the idea that the Nehru isn't a point, but the Nehru is a range of unemployment rates. Okay, so that if that's true, and that may be true, um, so you can, you can have that discussion, but it still isn't a discussion for saying, let's give the central bank a mandate on unemployment. What it really is, is saying, all right, let's make sure the central bank understands that the Nehru is not a point, it's a range, and then you can do the kinds of things that Greenspan did, and I think it was the late 90s when he was taking his opportunistic approach of saying, oh, well, let's just, let's, let's just, like, let's keep, let's not tighten monetary policy too quickly here, because we think that potential output is a little higher than what we think it is. We think the natural rate is a little bit lower than what some people think it is. So let's just keep going. Well, you can do that. You can do that. And that's a great use of judgment uh, by central bankers. But it doesn't mean you need to add in uh, unemployment or employment into the mandate. Uh, I, I think to me, that's just a great example of where if you have the judgment of central bankers and central bankers who do care about unemployment, because I've never met a central banker who doesn't care about unemployment. I, I don't really think they exist, um, um, but they can use their judgment to, to, to probe the limits of that Phillips curve, if you like. Um, I, I just want to have this quote that I keep, keep coming back to when I think about these things is that, that uh, you know, that business consultant James Collins, if you have more than three priorities, then you don't have any. Uh, in the case of monetary, monetary policy, I think we can bring that number down to if you have more, if the bank, if a central bank has more than one priority, then it doesn't have any. And that's kind of my, that's my concern about bringing in anything else other than some nominal instrument, you know, the price of gold, the price of the US dollar, one nominal uh, target because any once you have anything more than that, you uh, this is going back to what Michelle was mentioning, where you, you what if you miss? If you know how do you how do you know if you failed in any sense? If you have if you have one point, you're trying to do it in two dimensions. 
Chris? Can I just say quickly, Stephen, it's, it's not just about the number of targets you have. So you can have a, a Yan Timbergen sort of argument that says, look, if we've only got one instrument, only give us one target. Fair enough. But even if you don't accept that argument, even if you say, well, hold on, maybe you do have two instruments, right, at the Bank of Canada. Maybe there's two instruments if you think about things the right way. So it's okay, give us two targets. But then I would say the second part of the argument is, um, is the bank the best placed to actually pursue that second target? So I'm for, and we'll, we'll come back to this when we talk about climate, for example, or income inequality. Is monetary policy really the best target to pursue income inequality or climate change or even unemployment? And the, the nature of the instrument or financial stability, Right? So Michelle talked about this, that, that yes, I guess you could use the monetary policy or you know, the central bank instrument, the, the balance sheet or short-term interest rates. You could use that uh, and be influenced by stock market prices or other asset prices. But is that really the best instrument? Macro prudential tools may be way better, uh, way better designed and uh, way better, way more effective in pursuing that. So I think it's 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 not just an issue of the number of targets. It's does the central bank have the instrument that is really well designed to pursue that? Um, one thing that came up in the conference, uh, Angela Reddish um, noted that you know we, certainly the bank can document um, perhaps the, the effect of its um, its of its actions on things like income and wealth inequalities. But that's perhaps the best thing to do is just basically document it and leave it for um, the government, which has the fiscal and transfer and tax um, instruments that are probably better placed to, to deal with it. Like it's not, not that these things should pass unnoticed or unmentioned, but more or less like, OK, we cleaned up inflation. It's, a, it's for you guys to, uh, to clean up these other problems that came up along the way. And, and I'm, I'm in full agreement with that. I think that. We, when we think about optimal policies for our country, it's not all resting on the Bank of Canada. I think that when we talk about other things on first or, that, that are a first order sets of tools that we can use, the Bank of Canada has some mandate, again, in conjunction with the federal government. Now, this is why I was saying in terms of tweaks that I would prefer to see instead of introducing more discussion about whether or not there really is a you know, shadow dual mandate in the background that's being implemented with discretion, I would prefer to see changes if we were going to make them more in terms of strengthening what would happen, for example, if we hit that effective lower bound. Are there explicit rules or agreements that we can have with the fiscal authority who is the one who would have to pay for some of these things like increasing unemployment insurance benefits is there some sort of automatic stabilizers that could be adopted at that particular point and strengthen the toolkits sort of in a way together, monetary and fiscal policy working uh, towards the same goal in times of crisis? Yeah, I, think, things, uh, I, just, I don't see an official statement about a dual mandate, even with, with saying I'm targeting you know, income inequality, or I want certain portions of the economy to have uh, unemployment rates below this. These are very political issues. This is going to put tremendous pressure on the bank. It, it would change the nature of the conversations in some ways that I just don't think are, are going to be helpful. We can achieve a lot of the mandates right now in the framework that we have. Okay. Um, I guess we sort of- Could I just- well, <laughs> Oh, yeah, sure, sure, yes, sir, Mario, go, go, yes. Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to, uh, actually, I'm in, in an unusual agreement with me oh. at a certain <laughs> level, yeah, okay. which is, of course. That, that's uh, unusual automatically, uh, right? <laughs> no, but in one sense, you know, I'm going to explain how, you know, why. I, I was doing graduate studies, as perhaps Chris knows, at McGill, there in the, uh, doing my PhD in the 1970s, when it became all of a sudden, you know, with the rise of monetarism, Milton Friedman, all that. In fact, I remember Milton Friedman was at McGill, I think it was in 1975 or 76 there, even I think. But let me just say, then all of a sudden, central banks became all 
powerful. Okay, they had a thing that could, you know, they could do anything almost. The maestro there, as we call it, with Greenspan later on and so on. This kind of fantasy world is, of course, not the real world. We know, of course, that central banks have limits, and I'm the first to kind of say that. Indeed, we need to have coordination between fiscal and monetary policy to achieve anything of importance. Otherwise, they will be in conflict and creates havoc, the way I see it. And unfortunately, we've had cases of that in Canada going you know, in many ways here. But, but generally speaking, what we have had a coordination in the wrong way, uh, the way I see it, okay, that is to say that we kept the economy at a very high unemployment level Okay, through both fiscal and monetary policy going in one direction, as we know, like during the 1990s under Paul Martin, with a dozen years of, you know, fiscal austerity, let's call it here, you know, where we had balanced budgets or surpluses as the norm even. Okay, but so what I'm getting at here is that I absolutely agree with that. But at the same time, we also know okay, the central banks can in fact do things that could turn out the wrong way. And the best example of this is if the fiscal authorities are trying to achieve high employment, and if they still have stuck in their head some notion of a narrow, which practically to me doesn't exist, if you have it so wide that anything goes there, by the way, now, okay, with these Phillips curves, okay, if that is the case, even if there is such a thing as a narrow, what they will do is create havoc here because if the fiscal authority is trying to achieve high employment through you know, expansionary fiscal policy, well, the central bank is saying, hey, hold all your horses here because we must combat any, for preventive reason, combat any future inflation that will be associated with these unemployment rates. It will lead to creating the condition which in fact will be the problem, the way I see it. Okay. And what you want is a central bank that is indeed has its eyes and ears, so to speak, on these different goals in order to prevent that kind of problem from happening in the first place. And that's the issue to me. Okay, Chris. So Mario tried to shock the world by agreeing with <laughs> Michelle. So I would like to shock the world by agreeing with 80% of what Mario just said. OK, I think 80 percent is pretty good. So I want to I want to start with what Mario said about the fantasy world that he described in the late 1970s. I think I think we have we society has come to a point where we are expecting way too much from our central banks. And that's why I often talk about the limitations of central banking, because uh, many people seem to I don't think the central banks have forgotten about their limitations, but I think many people outside of central banks are expecting central banks to do all kinds of things. They're in the, you know, they're in the headlines every day. They're obviously important and smart people. And people talk about the central bank being the single most important policy institution in the country, which is questionable, right? It's a very important institution, but you know, I don't know if it's the single most important. Um, but I think there is this view that they are superheroes and they have to be superheroes and they have to solve every problem. And with all due respect to Steve Polas, who I have adored for many years, and other central bankers who are on the call, I think they're wonderful people, but they're not superheroes. And if you just come back to saying, well, hold on, what are the limitations of a central bank? And the limitations are fundamentally about what is the nature of the policy instrument that they control. And then it's a question about what do those policy instruments really do in the economy over the short run, over the long run, and what don't they do? Then I, I, I think we as a, as a society need to expect less from our central banks. On the second point, Mario talked about coordination. I'm all in favor. I mean, I, I actually do think that the Bank of Canada and the government of Canada do coordinate. I think they talk, they talk regularly, um, but at the same time, they have their mandate, right? The Bank of Canada has its mandate and the government of Canada has a much, much, much bigger and frankly more complicated mandate because there are hundreds of dimensions to fiscal policy where there are not hundreds of dimensions to monetary policy. So I think there is coordination and if we can coordinate better than we have been, let's do it, right? We, I mean, we, we all, I think we agree that we probably want low unemployment. We could have a debate about whether there is something useful called Nehru or not. Um, but I think we probably agree that we don't want 
excessive unemployment. We probably agree that we don't want high inflation. We probably agree that we you know, want uh, inequal equality of income or more equality of income. Uh, whether that's in the bank's purview or not is another matter. So I'll stop there, uh, Stephen, and you can take us you could take us further down these rabbit holes. Okay, uh, yeah, they, they, um, I just want to just throw the, uh, mention um, Nariana Kosha Dakota's uh, keynote speech during the conference because he made the point, well, he made, made the idea, proposed the idea that um, the, the Bank of Canada can be perhaps expected to impose a ceiling on inflation, but not a floor. The, the, the floor, like the, the, the lower bound would be, uh, would require uh, financial, would require fiscal policy to intervene. So, so, that was, so um, okay, so I guess the next thing is, so we sort of, I guess we sort of covered the next thing where we talked about uh, what the Bank of Canada can and cannot do. Um, I'm gonna look through the questions here. Yeah, I'll say Mario, go. Could I just say, I didn't comment on one aspect of uh, Chris's comments uh, earlier, having to do with uh, you know, the issues of goals, multi or not. Uh, I'm uh, the reason why I've been pushing for a dual mandate for a long time is because I believe in the following, which is that if you're also looking at unemployment, you know, if you're trying to target a much higher rates of unemployment than some Nehru kind of concept, okay, what it does, it guarantees also that an income distribution, you know, will be much more equitable. And this is because of what happens in the labor market, not only because obviously low interest rates tend to euthanize the rentiers, as Keynes would say here, meaning that you're going to have very low <laughs> you know, <laughs> interest income there, but uh, which we've had for a while, by the way, over the last decade. You, know, you could say there's been a bit of that. Okay? But, but more importantly is that it tends to be associated with, uh, you know, not necessarily for the, the kind of reasons explained by the transmission the, or the traditional transmission mechanism, you know, that is normally, you know, highlighted by central banks, but because of what I call the income distribution channels of, of monetary policy and how they impact on the economy, okay? But more importantly, I'm saying that if you look at, you know, not only would interest rates be lower and therefore associated with lower rentier income here, but more importantly, it will tend to push the bottom up here, so to speak, in the labor market. So you tend to get a much more equitable distribution of income and wealth, which are all good things that come together with that. So you got the, you know, two instruments, the way I see it, you got monetary policy instruments in terms of interest rates, you got fiscal policy here in terms of standard, you know, deficit spending or not at, on all that. And you've got here two goals here that can achieve more than two goals in reality. Okay. okay yeah, so, no, Michelle first. <laughs> okay. So just as, just as a general thing, we keep going back to the fiscal policy aspect, right? If what we're after is a more equitable society, Right. Again, right. I would argue that this falls very squarely on an elected government who has the tools to deal with it. If they want to change the tax system, they can change the tax system within reason, because we obviously live in a global economy and, and we can have people go. But in terms of talking about monetary policy and the tools and the scope of what the Bank of Canada can do, are, are you advocating, I guess maybe I should turn it back to you on this way, are you advocating that what we're sort of targeting is not even really, you know, what the average inflation, sorry, average rate of unemployment should be, but what the rate of unemployment should be for certain groups in a low income category? Because, I mean, now you're loading, again, a lot of political um, baggage onto the central bank to determine what, what should that be? If you're not gonna be explicit about it and it's just going to sort of be floating in the background, then I think that brings up a whole host of issues. Um, so that's one thing. And, and the other one that I, I guess I'll just also ask, uh, put back to you, like you've also talked about, I just saw somebody say, why is income distribution political? Well, I, I'm not sure I wanna to touch on that one. <laughs> just, I, I personally would find it uh, something that I, I think people, a number of people I know would, would consider it sort of a political thing I'm taking from this group to give to that group and, and the reasons for doing it. But if we're, if we're thinking about being explicit about these dual mandates, so we've already sort of said one of the things you said from the beginning is, well, they're sort of already doing a dual mandate, we should just sort of talk about it. Is there something that inside our system, the status quo the way it is with the bans, with constrained discretion, 
that you think something other would have really come out simply by making a statement being explicit that I also care about the unemployment rate. So I guess there's two things I'll just throw back. And I, I guess Chris wants to get in on. So I'll just disagree a little bit with Michelle. So I, to me, the key point isn't that the bank is appointed and the government is elected. I guess we could, if we wanted, we could set up an independent organization uh, you know, owned by the federal government. We could set up a crown corporation that's in charge of income inequality and is given a whole bunch of instru instruments to do with it. We could do that. Um, I, I don't think we should, but I think we could. To me, the fundamental point is income inequality is a super complicated thing. So um, in the latest version of my textbook, we've got, we talk about eight different causes of income inequality, whether it's the decline of the spread of unions or globalization or the superstar effect or Thomas Piketty and his arguments or others. Like there's eight arguments and there's probably more that I've forgotten, okay, or that I that I omitted, um, but it's super complicated. And I think about any of those eight causes of, of income distribution of, of growing income inequality. And I think, what could the bank do? And I'm, I'm not making the argument that the bank's policies don't have an influence on income inequality. I think they probably do, but I think it's more complicated than what we read about in the newspapers. So a lot of people say, well, the bank by keeping interest rates really low are they're feeding asset prices and that's obviously helping the 1%. Well, that may be true, but it's also the case that by keeping interest rates low, they may be supporting aggregate demand and supporting employment of low income workers. And that's actually working in the other direction. So I have not seen doesn't mean it doesn't exist, but I have not seen a compelling empirical study that says this is the connection between central bank policy and income inequality. And I suspect uh, that will be a long time coming because I think it is super complicated and the bank's instrument is super blunt. So again, I would come back to what is the instrument? What is it best suited for? And I don't think income inequality is the worst. Now, should we care about income inequality? Yes. Should we talk about it, debate it? Yes. Should we you know, design our fiscal policy better to deal with it? Yes. But I think you can do all of that and keep the Bank of Canada focused on what it can do best. Uh, could, could I just uh, you know, say no, here, uh, uh, I, uh, f first of all, there's a whole lot of literature now. In fact, uh, Louis-Philippe Pochon is here, also one of the, you know, he's been editing a bunch of books on, on, on this question. Uh, there's a huge literature on income distribution and monetary policy, you no, know, interest rate policy. So, I mean, if you want, I'll send you the references, even there's tens literally right now. And it's happened just over the last decade, okay? So I'm just saying there is, and I completely agree with you that there are other things besides monetary policy that could create these, you know, problems of income inequality for sure. I mean, as you said, globalization, name it, these are further add-ons here that compound the effect the way I see it. Okay. But the question is whether monetary policy could do that. And even our current governor last year in his, uh, in his, one of his papers that I read there, he talks about exactly that. He says, you know, obviously low unemployment economy would be one that will in fact lead to, will be associated with low wages kind of creeping up there, at least at the bottom there, they're gonna be moving upwards. And that will be in fact, a factor leading to, to, to lower inequality here. Now, uh, in terms of what Michelle was saying, Sure, there could also be the you know tax side of it, you know, but I'm talking about market wages here before tax. You know, there has been, as everybody knows, unless we live in a bubble here, over the last 40 years at least, we've seen incredible polarization going on here, okay, in terms of these market wages. And what I'm saying here now. All of that cannot possibly be attributed to monetary policy. No, but there is something there about that as well. And that I think is the important thing here. And what I'm saying is that with a dual mandate, you are able to at least deal with that question that in a sense you're completely oblivious to if you just have focus on the inflation rate. But as I said, what you're saying is not clear how we can actually control that. If we can certainly talk about the effect of monetary policy on our measures of, of inequality, and this is then leave and then just note it. But by the way, when we're doing this, this is what's happened. Uh, but it's it's hard it's it's hard to say like 
you know, right, right now, should the Bank of Canada increase the, uh, the or at any point, would, would Bank of Canada point uh, saying, we're going to increase the policy right now to reduce income inequality? How does that work? Is that really going, is that always going to be the case? We're going to, are we, we're going to do it for both? Or we should do it for increase for one goal. We should reduce it for another goal. So we're not going to do anything. This the uh, this this problem of having uh, using one one uh, one instrument two targets uh, is kind of fundamental. I don't see how it's going to disappear by saying it, yes. These other things are important. It doesn't mean we can control both. No, but they are associated. They're connected. That's what I'm saying. If you're worried about unemployment, you also do have some impact on these other variables. You know that we were talking. That about. comes back. That comes back to the argument for coordination. Then, just yeah. to say, well, yeah, I okay. against it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, but then, in, in terms of trying to go forward on this, like this goes back to one of the other things that that I sort of said very much at the beginning, more with respect to other uh, mandates. So, if this is what you're you're actually after, putting this into practice and trying to find language in a particular framework that actually gets at this issue, what is it that you would want to see put in writing? signed, yeah. sealed, and delivered that in practice you think is going to have a first order effect on this. That's not going to open up the doors to people wondering like, you know, if, if they could kind of do some of this stuff before, why do I explicitly have to write something down now if I already had discretion and the communication issues and missing of targets, because I worry about those costs and those, those communication issues I, I think are quite high. So how would you put this into practice? Uh, well, uh, I think it's, uh, first of all, it's important that I, you know, I come from, a, as I said, from a generation, you know, I started my, uh, uh, my studies in economics in the late 1960s. And I could tell you right now that at the time, even at the Economic Council of Canada, they used to talk about full employment as if it was something that was real, that we could actually define in some way. And all of a sudden came Nehru or, or the natural rate stuff in the 70s and 80s, and that disappeared. So I do believe strongly that we can actually come down to a, a much more meaningful you know, definition of what we, we consider to be high or full employment that we should try to achieve that is socially desirable. Okay, I do believe that. I don't think we are so different from the 1960s, let's say, that that cannot be done. Even though I agree that we have a changing industrial structure, you name it, I mean, there, there have been huge differences, but nonetheless, I do believe in that. And to some extent, actually, by the way, I would disagree with the Fed that kind of has a nebulous concept of full employment. I think it's because they want to get off the hook there and trying to, what, to achieve full employment when you could say, well, it's- Well, this, this is the thing, we, we, need, we need a target. Like, like what would yeah, you- Yeah, well, we this need, is, but I do social, believe, well, exactly. How would we know that I they think fail? we could actually pin it down much further. And I'm sure there are a lot of bright minds. I'm not gonna give you a simple answer to this one because I don't have a simple answer, but I could- What would you tell the minister? I could give you something close to that, okay? Uh, and, and I, and for instance, you know, I actually, I think David Laidler is uh, here uh, and uh, one of the, you know, is uh, watching this. And I remember he wrote with uh, Preston an, uh, an article over on the Phillips curve in 1967, where he argued at the time, okay, they argued at the time that it could be that, you know, maybe you could have a situation where the Phillips curve could even turn positively slope because the number <laughs> of new, uh, new hires at some point will be less than the number of quits in the economy or in the, in the labor market here in such a way that you, you kind of are hitting a, a, a kind of almost a, 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 let's call it a minimum point for the unemployment rate after which things get pretty difficult to achieve and, and indeed could turn in the other direction, so to speak, okay? Now, there are ways of trying to identify some numerical values that are meaningful. It could, it doesn't have to be literally one fixed point called 3% unemployment, let's say as an example, but it could be something like we do with targeting the inflation rate, which my God, you know, tell me which one should be, you know, where does that 2% come from? And why do we have the spread again? I think it's just as easy to do that with the unemployment rate, okay? But that's my opinion about that. And I do strongly, uh, you know, support a view here that we can actually achieve a certain level of what we could call 
full employment okay, that we used to describe at the time. And that was meaningful. You know, that former governors going back to Louis Razminsky, for instance, would have been comfortable with to say, yeah, that we should try to achieve full employment as if it meant something to them. Okay, but as I said, it doesn't have to be literally one point here, but it shouldn't be so open that anything goes again. And that's my fear here with the, with the US where they could kind of, you know, uh, I play around with that a little bit. But I, Mario, you know, I, think, I think the Bank of Canada um, thinks about full employment. Uh, maybe they use the word Nehru or the natural rate, but they well, that's not the same thing to full employment. And I think they... I think they think about it in the same way that you think about it. They, I think they want to achieve full employment. I think you might disagree about what full employment actually is, about what the rate of unemployment is at full employment. Mm -hmm. They might think it's 6%. You might think it's 4 I don't know. But you could have that disagreement, and that comes back to the flatness of the Phillips curve or whether there's actually a, well, you know, yeah. a range to the Nehru. But I don't think you fundamentally disagree with the notion of full employment. It's a kind of an empirical question about what it actually is. Well, only I, well, I, I'll agree with you to say that it might be that we are talking about the same thing, only if you actually, and this is where I think we differ with the Bank of Canada as well, there's still a strong belief that there's some sort of notion of Nehru there. Okay. When you got that, there's no way you could kind of talk about the same thing here. We're talking about totally different animals here. Okay. But if you do believe in the Nehru, now the question then is, is it wider or tight? You know, that's something we could debate as well. But I do believe that if, the, if your so-called notion of Nehru is one where, as, I have, as we've argued in the paper that we actually presented that would mark for your, for, you know, for your, uh, your school, uh, if, you, if you recall, we had this kind of Phillips curve there where we had a kind of dog-shaped Phillips curve there, which uh, in fact gave you a very wide spectrum here of you know horizontal Phillips curve here. Now, obviously, if you could, you could try to get it close to or very far from that whole wide range, then maybe we're getting closer to a full employment goal that might be a lot closer to what I would think it would be. Okay. But okay. I think it's more than 15, just that. No, I'm sorry. We have 15 yeah. minutes left. I'd like to, uh, no, uh, I'd like yeah, to no, throw, no. The, uh, throw it open to, to questions from the, the chat, because I think we're probably going around in circles here. I think everyone's basically making the same point again here. All right. So um, I'm going to scroll through. There's a lot of things coming up in the chat. But if you have something to, uh, to sort of say now would be a good time. I think that a lot of these are comments of went along along the way and have da, da, da. All right. Um, okay, yeah, that does any. There was an interesting question there from Diane Belmare about uh, comments yeah. on Larry Shembri's uh, speech and what that means for inflation or uh, monetary policy. Does anybody want to take that? Let me see. So 447. Oh. Well, uh, I mean, what we've been talking about, you know, I mean, it's all the fact that if you have a, an insensitive, you know, I mean, if the, if the Phillips curve is relatively flat, then, <laughs> You know, all of the the ability of the central bank to influence the inflation rate, in a sense, comes to a big crash here. <laughs> in the way I see it, yeah. I think um, that, yeah, that yeah, key yeah. element of the transmission. Mick Rowe has a point about the flat Phillips curve. If you're targeting two percent, everything's going to be flat. It's going to be flat as two percent. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Can I come back to Diane Belmar's comment? Okay, though? Well, I think well, no, I, she's talking about the efficiency of monetary policy. Right. But there's other uncertainties as well. I mean, it's not it's not just the uncertainties about the the wage responsiveness to excess demand or supply. I mean, especially today, um, there are all kinds of uncertainties. We, I mean, we we don't know how widespread the supply uh, chain disruptions are. We don't know how long they're going to last. We don't know whether that's what's the fundamental cause of the inflation, how much of it is pent up demand versus the supply chain disruptions, how much of it is 
the massive monetary expansion that at some point, if not now, is starting to leak out into credit growth. I mean, I, I think the truth is we are in a new sort of world um, with COVID and um, we don't know all of the causes, temporary or permanent, of inflation. Um, and, and so monetary policy, is, I wouldn't say it's flying blind, but I, it's got to be the case that, I mean, we should probably have sympathy for our central bankers, folks. They are, being, they are confronting more uncertainty today than they have in, in I suspect, a long time. Um, and that and that means they've got to really, uh, you know, they're working in the dark and they've got to they've got to inch along. Um, but I, I don't think it's just about uncertainties in the labor market. No, I think there's uncertainty across large portions of, of what we're doing right now. And that actually, from my point of view, you know, if we're going to make that, I think that even makes the bar even higher. If we're going to change policy at right. this particular junction, right, without having it fully understood what is it even in a dual mandate or, or what you were saying a multi-targeted mandate you know how are we going to actually express this and put it to the public without causing perhaps extra uncertainty in this communication in this environment where you know if we unhinge any kind of inflation expectations i think we're in worse shape than we would than than we would have without you know making the the, the leap uh, so to speak, uh, from what it is that we have that, I mean, right now, if I look at inflation expectations in Canada and stuff, they're still pretty well hinged, right? I mean, I look at the same numbers in the United States, they're, they're <laughs> changing a lot more rapidly uh, right now. Uh, and I, I think part of it is is exactly what, what Chris was saying at, at the beginning, you know, I, over what time period am I going to work on in order to bring inflation back down? I, I you know, I haven't been explicit about that. And I've changed you know, statements about unemployment to be more distributional than than even sort of in a target range. So I do worry about putting, again, putting this actually into practice in a way that we can put pen to paper that doesn't have unintended consequences that are actually in the negative uh, direction. Um, Michelle, this is like this is your point about the expectations. Um, Louis, uh, Louis Philippe Rochon has uh, mentioned a couple of times about the Jeremy Rhodes. Uh, mm -hmm. Thing about uh, saying expectations don't matter. Um, I don't think that's a consensus view. Just have your response on to that. Do you, do you guys have seen that? Or heard I of haven't. It? I haven't really seen that paper, so I'm not okay. going to comment. <laughs> okay, Chris. Then. Yeah, I guess my my quick take on that paper was, um, I think you had to have a fairly extreme view that suggested that inflation expectations were only forward looking, right? Um, there may be some situations where there's a very credible policy announcement uh, about a deviation of policy and that really swings things. But I guess my take on this has always been that there's some combination of backward looking expectations and forward looking. Um, and so I kind of thought maybe I just missed the point of that paper, but I was just underwhelmed by by the argument that they're, you know, they're not as crucial as people say they are. I thought it was a bit of a straw man, frankly. Okay. Um, Doug Laxton, uh, okay. it's like, that's like, we'd like to ask him, course, I'm just going to unmute him for a second. Uh, so quick, quickly, please, Doug. Oops. Oh, shoot. Um, could somebody please, uh, okay. unmute? Oh, there we go. Uh, everything's, everything's good now. So hello to everybody. And thank you very much, uh, for the wonderful, uh, discussion. Um, when you ask that question about the dual mandate, uh, for me, uh, it really is important to know whether or not uh, there's going to be numerical targets for the unemployment rate, because I'd be dead against in that case. If it's expressed uh, like, like the Fed does it or like the Reserve Bank of New Zealand does it, where there is no numerical targets, then I'm all for it. Okay. Uh, and in fact, uh, when we started using this term flexible inflation targeting, it was because the myth of inflation targeting, uh, we're trying to get rid of that, trying to work on that. So so I, I, that, that's kind of the first question. Second question, this is for uh, Mario. Um, I loved his chart of Canadian unemployment and uh, US unemployment. And so uh, given the way that you view this, uh, Mario, uh, given that we have the benefit of hindsight now, uh, I view that we would have learned uh, hopefully faster if we would have had this dual mandate, we would have realized the natural rate of unemployment was shifting up faster than what we actually did learn. 
And so then we would have taken action, probably not monetary policy action, but action to deal with the rising natural rate of unemployment. Uh, the other question is like during the, you know, we have the global fiscal expansion uh, in response to the global financial crisis, but then we tighten fiscal policy. We actually tighten monetary policy after that. Like in the system that you had, would we have had looser uh, monetary and fiscal policy uh, during that period? So could you be specific about how the world would have looked different? Like how would we have benefited? Okay, little, not more quickly, please. That's it, that, that's basically it. Uh, it's sort of Michelle's question. Uh, like tell me exactly how things might've been uh, different. Uh, that's, that's my question. Uh, um... Well, I mean, uh, quickly, please. We're running out of time. This is a, it's, it's a loaded question there because there are many aspects to this that you raised, uh, except that I do believe that if we would have, uh, in fact, had a, a, a much more loose or whatever you want to call it, monetary policy during that whole era, okay, when we saw these incredibly high or high and rising unemployment rates, as you know, uh, is, is starting in the 80s and then even throughout most of the 90s until we start seeing a, you know, a decline at some point. Uh, this would have been a period where we, we, we could have, uh, you know, a whole generation, a whole lost generation of people could have been, you know, employed and achieved uh, the kind of living standards that were lost as a result of it, you know. So, I mean, I, I cannot add more to that other than say there was a terrible loss during that whole era that we should never have lost. Now, in terms of your point about a rising NARO, it's interesting. If you look at, uh, well, I can't show it to you again, there, but that graph, it's incredible to see how, although there's a lot of fluctuations for the US, it's relatively stationary almost, the unemployment rate, okay? So if you were believing in some sort of average unemployment as being connected with a Nehru, then there was never any really big jump there in the Nehru. I think it's a figment of our imagination that it was that. Okay, okay. There, um, there's one, one last That's question. the point I'm making here, okay? Okay, okay. I'm but sorry. I appreciate you your point. Here. Okay. Uh, there's lots of questions here and we can't, we can't spend them. There's one question that's been um, second, third, and fourth uh, from Joël uh, Leclerc. Uh, do you think that in this case, the central bank, oops, hold it. Is that, that's where it starts, Joel? And oops, is this it? Yes. 517. 517, oh shoot. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to. Da, da, da. 517, yes. <laughs> okay, I'm not seeing it, darn. Do you think that in this case, the central bank should only pursue inflation when inflation is caused by temporary supply side issues? Wouldn't that hit employment levels pretty hard? Um, I'd like to be on the speaker. Cool. Yes. So I think this is a great example of how difficult monetary policy is. So monetary policy is, you know, it has an instrument that is fundamentally about changing the demand side of the economy in terms of changing interest rates or changing the amount of money in the economy, uh, working through financial markets and stimulating or contracting aggregate demand. When you get hit with a supply shock, no matter what it is, it's it just makes monetary policy, it's a challenge for monetary policy. Now, the big supply shocks that were induced by OPEC driven oil price changes in the 1970s were a huge challenge for monetary policy. The supply chain disruptions that we are seeing today are a huge challenge for monetary policy. So what you see Tiff Macklem doing, uh, you know, and, and other central bankers is saying, look, folks, we've got some inflation, but we also think that there's these supply chain disruptions going on and we don't know how long they're going to last. And what they're basically saying is, we want to look through these things. We want to let the dust settle, uh, but we don't quite know how long that's going to last. But what their worry also is, so they don't want to respond to those if they knew that they were going to be short-lived. But at the same time, they, if the longer lived they are, the more likely they are to set off wage increases, which will then take on their own life of driving a wage price spiral, at which point you might actually want monetary tightening. So like most supply shocks, it throws a central bank into a real quandary. And I think that the, the solution here is not necessarily to raise rates right away, but is to communicate with the people and to explain why a supply shock or why this particular type of supply shock is so difficult and why it's a challenge for monetary policy, because not all inflation is the same. 
Yeah. And, and I, I completely agree with that, but we have that. That's going back to the whole <laughs> issue about the current framework. We have that flexibility. We have bans. We have acknowledgement of the fact that there is flexibility and some discretion in here. And I think the central bank communications being clear about that, you know, has worked, right? It hasn't been a disaster in, in any of these kind of things. And it goes back to, again, <laughs> putting pen to paper. I mean, it could have been a disaster, I guess, in some sense, depending on the magnitudes of the shocks and, and how this, this was unfolding, but it hasn't been, right? Our current status quo framework has seen us weather a whole series of crises since we have put this in, okay? COVID is just the, the most recent of them. So, be- so, you know, that's why I said the bar, I think, still is very high to move away from something that has clearly done pretty well here in Canada. I mean, we can talk, I I saw a comment earlier fly up about Japan or something, but here we're talking about the framework in the Canadian context with the Canadian uh, realities, shall we say, about the fiscal policies and institutions and such here and levels of unionization, et cetera. But that just means that, you know, going back to when when Doug restated my question, thank you, Doug, (laughs) uh, you know, for that. What would have changed if we adopt, if we move, right, from this, from putting in this language without, you know, having like some real teeth to it, you know, is, is this just, you know, writing it down because we said, oh, well, we're being more transparent, but, but we've already acknowledged in, in what the, yeah. the governor is saying in most of these cases, exactly what the thinking is. So that's why I, I, I sort of, uh, st- I still just, am sort of looking for the bite. <laughs> I, I just want to add something to what Joel asked. I mean, any kind of, I mean, look, any supply side kind of shock here, whatever you want to call it due to the system, okay, as we're facing today in terms of supply shortages, for instance, due to bottlenecking, whatever, I mean, all these sorts of factors are in place. Monetary policy cannot play any role in that for sure. It, certainly not directly. You cannot, because all you have is one real instrument, which is interest rate policy, essentially, the way I look at it. Okay. And therefore, that's a purely demand side kind of, you know, uh, let's get variable here that would not uh, play any role in changing the fact that we can't get the ports of Vancouver to move more quickly or, or whatever the reasons are there. Yeah. So in that regard here, uh, I, I, I agree here that, you know, this is a case where, you know, central banks are not at all, you know, the, 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 the appropriate here uh, in dealing with, uh, with the kind of inflation that we're facing. I'm just going to jump in here, Doug. Uh, you know, uh, just uh, Nick Rowe made a point for oh, NGDP, yeah. NGDP targeting is that it actually would treat supply shocks differently. Um, you would, uh, NGD, NGDP targeting would try to el- eliminate inflation fluctuations and demand shocks, but accommodate them from supply shocks. So the uh, NGDP targeting would not be too concerned about um, the, in, in a, surge in, a temporary surge in inflation that's accompanied by a reduction in, that, in, uh, in, in supply. But that, that's certainly true, but it still doesn't get away from the very difficult problems associated with, I think, fully communicating this with lagged amounts of, of data coming in and, and the revisions. I know Steve has always been a, a fairly strong proponent of, of uh, NGP, NGP targeting, but I still think there are a lot of complications associated with actually putting it into practice. And I think we run risks. We run very serious risks uh, for central bank uh, credibility. Uh, and, and I think these are, these are things that really should not be taken lightly. Okay. Um, okay. We're getting we're really close to here. Chris, so I think there's something, one last I, question. I, I, I agree with what, what Michelle just said. And I, I, think, I think some people think that communication of a policy is a small thing and it's just a, a side issue. And I really don't think that's true. I think the ability to communicate what the central bank is doing and why is a huge part of the success of a policy. And so what we've seen over, what I would argue is over 30 years, roughly 30 years, we've seen, um, you know, the bank targeting inflation. And as I said earlier, like they, when inflation is above target, they kind of know, people know what's happening, what's going to happen in the future. When it's below target, we kind of know what's going to happen. We don't have to, the bank doesn't have to explain it 
as much probably today as they used to, but still have to keep explaining it because the people keep changing. But there's a there's a coherence to it um, that I think makes the bar very high to change. And I think nominal GDP targeting, which I think is quite right what Nick Rowe said, um, I think it probably would technically deal better with supply shocks. I think that's probably right. If you can get everybody to understand what you're doing. And that's hard, I think. Okay, um, we're, I think we're basically, Chris, we're basically out of time. Maybe I can't, I can't see Katrina, but I'm pretty sure we're over time. There's one last question that um, I guess we're gonna end with. Is actually gonna like it too. It's a uh, Guillermo uh, Meta, Matamoros. I mean, I mean, sorry, I mean, I mean, if um, if monetary policy is that complex, why do we leave it only to economists? I just like to point out this is why we had this conference. Okay, we uh, I, I I was I was not happy with um, how uh, the mandate renewals have all have gone in the past, where it's basically always been cloistered within the bank, experts only, invitation only. Um, this is, of course, a political decision, and it really should be discussed by people other than just economists. We have a certain, you know, we have things to say, uh, but we have to explain it to non-economists as best we can. Um, and uh, we have to convince them if, if, if we want to do things. So, yeah, why? why well, yeah, we, need, we, we do need more people getting interested in this. Um, well, hold on, hold on there, Steve. So you've just argued why it shouldn't just be economists at the Bank of Canada. I would agree with that. Well, they, they, they why, it be, why it should be talked about to the people, and I agree yeah. with that. But if we're going to have economic policy made, um, I, I'm going to argue that having economists actually at the center of that, maybe not only economists, but yeah. lots of good economists at the center of that is a good thing. I think there's always an argument for job security for economists. Uh, I'm voting for the economists. I, I want to I wanna be in favor of the economist party here. I, I don't disagree with you, but there shouldn't be mainstream economists. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> so that's what it comes down <laughs> that's to. That's the problem. <laughs> but I think obviously expertise and expertise and you know, tried and true experience in terms of things for communication and, and dealing with, with these things on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, obviously has to play, I think, a, a very important role in, in doing this. I, I think it needs to be explained to individuals. I think public debate on this is useful. It's also useful for just educating individuals on the options that are out there and why it's not just a mysterious black box. I think it, it does lead to credibility also by having these, these discussions. Okay, folks, um, we have to wrap this up. But before we say goodbye, we need to redo the survey. We need to see if anybody's views were changed by what, the, you know, the last 90 minutes. So there's the poll. Please take the time to do it. Um, vote, vote, vote and see vote early, vote often. Let's see what happens. We've got uh, another 25 people to vote. Uh, okay, we, I'm going to give it about 10 more seconds, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three. I think we've stabilized at 46 votes. Okay. And there are the results. Do you see those? Steve? Um, I, I see them, but uh, maybe you can read them out. Okay, how about that? Does, do people see that? In the audience, do people see that? I'm seeing people nod their heads. Okay, okay. Michelle, so, you, Michelle, you have done it again. <laughs> to let you know, <laughs> there we go. I, I, I can't possibly take full credit for this. I think uh, certainly uh, the, the central bankers also who are, have stayed very quiet actually during this entire <laughs> the so, debate, obviously have put these things in. Just to recap the numbers, uh, the status quo that at the beginning of the call was 32% is now 48%. Um, the dual mandate that was 40% 90 minutes ago is now 37. The average inflation targeting, oh, takes a hit from 22 down to nine. And the other option went from six to seven. So that's more or less stable. Okay, folks, um, thank you very much uh, for joining us today. 
Thank you, Steve Gordon, Michelle Alexopoulos, and Mario Sekaricia. I have to say it with the right accent. Uh, thank you all for, for being here today. Uh, as I said, this is probably our last kick at the can for, uh, for talking about this issue and influencing whoever might be listening, because this decision will, uh, if, if history is any guide, this decision will be made and announced within the next few weeks. So uh, let's all keep our fingers crossed for our own private hopes. And uh, thank you all again for being here and thank you all for attending. Uh, this is recorded. Um, and so if you'd like to share this with your friends, uh, please do so. So um, thank you all very much and I wish you a good evening. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much.